Welcome back to Garden Talk, brought to you by the Penn State Erie County Extension. And again, today I'm your co-host, Mike Paley, along with Ellen DePlacido. Ellen, you there, please? I am. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, yes. Hey, last time we started talking about uh, Japanese beetle control, and we talked mm-hmm. about control during the larva stage. Today we want to talk about actually the control of the uh, beetle itself, the, the adult beetle. And uh, before I do that, though, I want to mention to everyone that these sessions are now going to be available on the Erie County Library site. And uh, you can just go to that site and, you know, I have to fumble through it myself initially here, okay? Probably, it's probably going to be available by the end of the week, so I just want to give everybody a little bit of a heads up. I can give you a little bit more specifics next week, okay, or later in the week when we, well, next week when we do, when we do another set of sessions. And uh, as far as the specifics, so I'll have time to get on there in the interim and figure out the exact directions. But there's a lot of good people out there who might be able to figure it out on their own. So, but as far as control of the adult Japanese beetles, Ellen, there's some mechanical uh-huh. mechanical trapping that can be done, correct? Oh, yes, supposedly. Okay. There are these Japanese beetle traps that contain some sort of sexual lure. It's, it's a scent of floral-based compounds. And those compounds attract both the male and female beetle. But some of these beetles fall into the trap. But the operative word here is some, okay, not all of them. And these traps attract more beetles than you would probably have in your yard if you didn't have a trap. I mean, they attract beetles from your neighbor's yard and and all around. So some of the females, after mating, deposit their eggs in the ground just below or near that trap itself. And that results in failing turf near the trap itself. So you may also find increased feeding on your plants near the trap. So um, we're not really recommending traps. Okay, so Alan, this is where we joked last time around (laughs) about maybe re-gifting that trap that you got for for Father's Uh Day or something like that. Right. Uh, Give it give it to the neighbor a couple couple of houses down, (laughs) and they'll attract your beetles. So. (laughs) The other thing, I mean, I kind of like doing this. I mean, it's not really that fun, but I kind of, it's hand picking, you know, and you can, you you can hand pick beetles off of your small plants. I pick them off my zinnias, hibiscus, and rose bushes. Um, You go out early in the morning and you kind of just tap those beetles into either a jar or a small bucket of soapy water. And you've captured a lot of beetles that way and it's not difficult Uh, but the other way is using insecticides and we just want to remind you to be careful when you use these to try to keep the application away from the flowers of your plants because these synthetic substances can be harmful to your pollinators so mike's going to talk to you a little bit about the biologicals and the synthetics that you can use yeah you're right and and it's so very important to Mm -hmm. read the labels on all of these compounds now first of all we're going to talk about some uh, biologicals which are you know certainly not as big of an issue and then we'll talk about a few synthetics but if i could just add a a comment about the hand picking you know ellen mentioned the fact that that needs you can do that in the morning okay Mm -hmm. believe it or not they're a little sluggish in the morning the beetles are yeah. And if you mm-hmm. get them in the morning, okay, there you can you can knock them off those plants into that container of of soapy water a whole lot easier than you can once they get yes. warmed up. Otherwise, you, they yeah. do like to fly away. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they get a cup of coffee in them and stuff like that. And they're, <laughs> yeah. they're pretty active after that. Right. But as far as the biologicals are concerned, this BT with a variety of Gallaria, G A L L E R I A E, it does not harm bees. And mm-hmm. it's it it can be effective, you know, on the adult beetle, as well as the as well as the grubs, and again, that is, t- I believe, it's sold by in a garden alive. You can go on, you know, on, on the internet and get to their particular website. Again, that's Garden Alive, and it's uh, I, I think it's called Beetle Gone or Beetle Just. Okay. Also, another mm-hmm. product that is very similar to the BT is that Spinosad, and. Uh, it's not labeled for applications on Japanese beetles just yet, but I've had some luck with it. So, okay. with with, and with other beetles also. So I would I would give that a try. Um, there's another product. Okay, it's a it's a it's one of the neem along the neem lines, um, where they it's a product that is made from the 
you know, seeds of that of that neem tree. And as a dactrican, okay, A Z A D I R A C T I N, that can be effective also as uh, the pyrethrins, okay, and the, the py- pyrethrins, excuse me, they're okay for yeah. food crops, okay, but you don't want to spray them on the bees. Uh, and I say okay for food crops. Uh, well, the toxicity, okay, of them is minimal and it diminishes very quickly. So, again, keep that in mind. As far as the synthetics are concerned, um, you know, again, you have to think of, you know, pretty much all synthetics as being harmful to pollinators. And I, I think that's the approach that you should use. But, again, Carbaryl, R7, and, and if you'll remember, that's one of the products that we kind of recommended that you probably have in your uh grouping of, of things yeah. to to use in the garden because it is kind of effective and you can use it on food crops um, if you're if you're careful and it breaks down in a hurry um, but it can be harmful to to pollinators so you have to be you know be careful of it there um, you know and, and then there's a couple of other things that we'll mention that are you know I would not use on food products okay, and can be harmful to, to pollinators, but you know, maybe you're going to use it on your flowers, okay, which is fine. And one of them is bifenthrin, that's the active ingredient. And the other, another one is beta cyfluorothin <laughs> uh, and lamb cyhalothin and, and, <laughs> and, and imidacloprid. Um, you know, um, those substances can be effective also. Uh, I use the bifenthrin, okay, on, that's B-I-F-E-N-T-H-R-I-N. I use that to help control, you know, the stink bugs from entering, oh. my, from entering my house. And uh, I'll, I'll spray that on, the, on some of the openings, and that seems to be quite effective. And the, the imidacloprid, I-M-I-D-A-C-L-O-P-R-I-D, is something that's kind of readily, more readily available than some of these other products also. So, you know, take a look at those, but be careful with the synthetics okay, when it comes to, you know, care of pollinators and also care of yourself. And, you know, some of these synthetics, uh, the biologicals I'd use on food, but, you know, some of these synthetics other than, you know, light dose of carbaryl, I probably would not. So Ellen, it looks like we've used up our time for again today. So for this particular session anyways, okay. So thank you for listening and hope you're here with us next time. Bye-bye.